When you talk about the Romans, sometimes it seems like the only thing you talk about is war. In part, that's because the Romans built a lot of monuments to wars that they fought. And of course, that's because they fought a lot of wars. But most nations do, you know. There aren't, and there haven't really been, many nations in the history of humankind that haven't done a lot of fighting. But not every nation builds memorials to that. And in any nation, not every people feels the same way about it at every time. You could say that a culture gets the monuments it deserves in a way. But sometimes in the course of history of a certain people at a certain time, even in the necessity or the perceived necessity of fighting, somebody comes along and is more reflective about it. It's rare, but it's not, it's not unheard of. We don't have any war memorials from Iron Age Greece. They were not rich enough or technologically sophisticated enough to build nation-enhancing memorials. But there is a very perceptive reflection about just what ultimately is the benefit or disadvantage of fighting in the Iliad, which we know, of course, from the archaeological remains that the Greeks all heard and sometimes emulated. In Book nine of the Iliad, Achilles, for a change, is ticked off. He spends almost all of the Iliad being ticked off. That's part of the point of the Iliad. He's in his tent and he's sulking because Agamemnon has taken away one of his prizes, who happens to be a female slave. And Odysseus comes to Achilles in his tent and says, you know, we need you. We need you to come and fight. You are the best warrior we have. And Hector will take the field, and he is the best warrior that the Trojans have. If you do not fight, we will lose. And Achilles says to him, as I detest the doorways of death, I detest that man who hides one thing in the depths of his heart and speaks forth another. But I will speak to you the way it seems best to me. Fate is the same for the man who holds back as the one who fights hard. We are all held in a single honor, the brave with the weaklings. A man dies still if he has done nothing as one who has done much. Why must the Argives fight with the Trojans? Why was it that the son of Atreus, that's Agamemnon, assembled and led here these people? Was it not for the sake of lovely-haired Helen? Are the sons of Atreus alone among mortal men, the ones who love their wives? in an entire epic about the glory of war and the victory of the Greeks. 
the poet inserted some truths that I think only somebody who has faced death too young, the possibility of it, that is somebody who has had to go to war, might reflect on. It took another 1,000 years before we have as eloquent a rejoinder to what was said in the 8th century BCE by a Greek poet. And that was from a Roman emperor in the 2nd century CE. In the time of Titus and Domitian, from whom the relief that you've been looking at here comes, the spoils relief from the Arch of Titus in Rome, war is just about winning. It's only about triumph. There's no hardship. There's no cost. Maybe it's because Domitian, the person who put this relief up on this victory arch, didn't go to war. When you look back, it's easy to pick out the high points. Well, maybe not easy, but certainly beneficial to a glorious sense of self. Trajan, the emperor who came to power two years after Domitian was killed in the year 98, fought two long, hard campaigns on the Danube frontier in Dacia. And he built a very different sort of monument to the battle that he fought. And that monument was this column, 100 feet high, dedicated in the year 113, May 28th, in his forum. The forum itself is a kind of victory monument with all of those captive Dacian prisoners, which you saw last time, up on the, the attic story surrounding the huge two football field by three football field piazza. And then there's the giant, beautiful basilica, one of the most beautiful buildings in Rome, say all of the people who lived in Rome then, or anyway, those who wrote about it. And then the libraries on either side uh, behind the basilica, and then in between those, this column, commemorated, as you see, on a Roman coin. The Romans liked to do that when they, when they built something pretty fancy. And here, war is still heroic, and even more so, it is epic. 2,500 figures on the reliefs on this column engage in marching and building camps and pursuing prisoners and speaking with, with, with embassies and other missions and making sacrifices and fighting and sometimes losing. But ultimately, of course, prevailing. The enemy is stubborn. The enemy is many. The enemy is clever. And so the war is difficult, which makes the heroism and the victory and the glory at the end, 100 feet high at the top, that much, that much sweeter. War is not whitewashed in the column of Trajan. So here you see Trajan himself. Here's, here's Trajan again in, in a quiet moment with a young aide. Here is Trajan receiving decapitated heads of Dacians, Roman soldiers eagerly proffering the evidence of the gruesome evidence of the victory in battle. But these scenes are so carefully embedded within this long 710-foot spiral. They don't leap out 
They don't hammer home some specific message. Because in essence, this is still an era when the Romans are living in the present moment. Their empire is expanding. Dacia is conquered. And to borrow a modern and pretty banal sentiment, in, in most respects, life was good. Life was good in Rome in the second century CE. And when you are pleased with your nation and your government and its activities, the monuments and the memorials you make reflect that. Trajan campaigned almost constantly throughout his reign, 98 to 117, and was succeeded by a nephew, a fellow Spaniard, whom we know as Hadrian. Unlike Trajan, Hadrian was not really interested in campaigning at all. He was not interested in fighting. He came to power at the moment of Rome's far most territorial expansion. And he held it there. He didn't look to make it any larger. What he was really interested in doing was traveling around this vast, essentially peaceful empire because he was curious and interested in the world as it was then. Before he left Rome, which you see here in aerial view, for the beginnings of his travels in the year 121 CE, he inaugurated a new series of games, athletic contests, held in the Circus Maximus, which you see here, and the Colosseum. And he struck a coin in honor of those games. This is a um, portrayal of a, of a deity holding the wheel of a chariot and leaning up against the turning post of the chariot racing course. So down the middle of the circus, there was a spine, and the, the chariots went up one side and then down the other. And right here at this end was the, was the turning post, which, which looks like this. The coin was struck in honor of the 834th birthday of Rome. April 21st, 121 CE. What's the date that the Romans are counting from? What's the date that the Romans are counting from? What's the year? Uh, 753. <laughs> 753 BCE. It's interesting. No, the Romans don't count from 509. They count from 753. They count from the very beginning, from Romulus. Hadrian departs uh, in the spring of 121 from Rome. First, he travels to the Danube frontier to make sure that all is quiet and uh, that there won't be any surprises as he moves along on his travels. He goes then to Britain, the furthest northeast of the provinces of Rome, an area that was captured by the Roman Emperor Claudius, one of the Julio-Claudians. And in Britain, rather than, again, engaging in anything polemical, anything aggressive, he instead 
you see this little line across the top there that separates Britannia from Caledonia. Caledonia is what today we essentially call Scotland. He built a wall saying, Rome ends here. Up to this point, Rome. After this point, not. No fighting, just a statement of fact. Rome does not expand infinitely. Rome has an edge. This is it. Hadrian's Wall, uh, begun in the year 122, uh, which you can still take a trip to and in northern Britain and, and walk along for its, its, its great length, very fancy. From the northeastern provinces, Hadrian traveled down to the southeastern provinces, Egypt and Palestine and, and Syria. In the countries that, in the nations that he visited, in the provinces that he visited, uh, cities built fancy memorials to him. It would be like uh, if the president comes to St. Paul, we, we build a victory arch because he's here. Well, we wouldn't. But if we were ancient Romans, we would. And that's what, for example, the people here at Jerash did in Jordan, built this huge um, arch as a kind of gate into the city um, on behalf of Hadrian when he, when he arrived there in the year 130. But Hadrian's real aim in his traveling was to get to Athens. Athens, of course, was very famous. Athens was a very famous place because it was very old, not as old as Rome, but old and still extremely impressive. The, the seat of wisdom and learning and magnificent architecture. And, and Hadrian was uh, very enamored of all things Greek. He was kind of a Phil Hellene. He loved things that, that were Greek. He, he traveled to the city, and he, he made a lot of benefactions to the city so that he could become, he could make himself part of the history of Athens. So one of the things he did was finally finish this temple. You remember this temple? Probably not. <laughs> when was this temple, the temple to Olympian Zeus in Athens, begun? When was it begun? You might need to look at back at one of those little timelines that you've got, one of those little charts that you've made. Thank you, sir. Who? By whom? <laughs> You're not Googling, are you? <laughs> Since I see the unearthly aura of the computer LCD screen illuminating your face, that'd be cheating. Wouldn't that be rude? Here you guys are looking through at your dim back notes, and he's looking on his computer. Who does it? Who starts the building of this? <sighs> How soon we forget. <laughs> I talk about everything for only five minutes. <laughs> A lot of stuff to talk about. <laughs> I'm waiting. Thank you, Pisistratus. So Hadrian comes along. So that's the 6th century BC, 6th to 5th, 4th, 3rd, 2nd, 1st, 1st, 2nd, 700 years. Talk about an overextended building project. There had been attempts to finish it prior, but, but nobody had really been able to bring it home. So Hadrian does. He completes the Temple of Olympian Zeus, um, and it's dedicated in the year 131. The columns are... Uh, about 55 feet high, and there's a forest of them, a huge number of columns. Of course, you remember that the whole point of these 
many, many gigantic columned buildings that were constructed beginning in the 6th century BCE were, to, were inspired by the constructions of a much earlier imperial entity, that of the Achaemenid Persians. Because this is one of those things that imperial entities do is build big. And that's why Hadrian felt simpatico with the Temple of Olympian Zeus project and, and decided to, to complete it. And then he built this weird, he built this weird thing. You see it right here. It's an arch. Um, of course, you have to just imagine away all the housing of the lower placa of the, of the city of Athens, which wouldn't have been there by now. It's an arch um, and a really weird one. It uh, almost looks like there are parts missing. Um, but this is more what it would have looked like in antiquity um, with the completed Olympian, the temple to Olympian Zeus behind. And uh, we call it the Arch of Hadrian because Hadrian built it and dedicated it uh, in that same year. There would have been uh, originally statues, two statues in these two side um, niches above the attic. And there were inscriptions, one on each side. The inscription that is on this side, so you're, you're in, I mean, the Acropolis is behind you, and you are uh, looking through the arch at the temple of Olympian Zeus. And that inscription says, this is Athens, the ancient city of Theseus. Theseus is one of those great mythic old guys. And emphasizing what would have been to Hadrian uh, the entire point. Athens, the city of Theseus, in the same way that Rome was the city of Romulus. This is an ancient city that was part of its allure, that was part of its point. And then on the side facing the Acropolis, this is what it looks like today, and you can see just past here the height of the Acropolis between the arcade of the of the arch. The inscription on this side in antiquity said, this is the city of Hadrian, not of Theseus. This is, this is just strange, actually. Um, you have to figure that what he means is the side of the city that you're on, not the side of the city that you're passing to. That is, over here, this is the ancient side of the city. This is the ancient city of Athens. Um, the city of Theseus. And then back here, where you're in the precinct of the Olympian, this is the city of Hadrian. Hadrian made some more benefactions to the city of Athens. We're now standing on the Acropolis, looking down in the, yes? Was the, inscription? the inscription was in Greek. Yes, it was. Thank you. Good question. The inscription was in Greek. So that everybody there would understand it. Hadrian knew Greek. He studied Greek. He read the ancient philosophers. He is very in love with the Greeks. Which is why, I actually forgot to point this out when I had his portrait up there. You saw the two portraits, Trajan and Hadrian. And what you might have focused on was that they were both wearing army cuirasses, breastplates. And that's true. But uh, Hadrian had a beard, which was, let me say to you, a fashion statement of a very specific sort back then. And here was the statement, I love the ancient Greeks. That's what the beard meant. Because portrait heads of ancient Greek philosophers, they all looked like, you know, dead old white males. Bearded, curly hair, beards. And, and Hadrian had a beard because he loved all things Greek. There you go. All right, so we're on the Acropolis looking down. The, um, the Agora is off in this direction, so, so uh, we're looking a little bit, let's see, where am I? North, uh, we're looking a little east of that, and we're looking at this area right here, which of course sort of looks like, I don't know, urban sludge in this particular view, but is the uh, area where an enormous complex was built by Hadrian and dedicated a huge library. And here is a piece of the facade of the library. And here a reconstruction, again, from those clever folks at UCLA with their computer reconstructions. 
of um, the library proper. And you can see the plan. Um, there's there's a, a gateway going in. This was the w wall of engaged columns that you just saw before. And then an enormous open area planted with a colonnade all the way around. And there you see the Acropolis up in, in the distance. And uh, here's a plan of it. What Roman building or complex does this remind you of? Which specific Roman building or complex does this remind you of? What? Which? What do you say? The forum. <gasps> yes. <laughs> Woo! Pulled that one out. Yeah, indeed. This was a very admired plan and was transmuted across um, across the empire in lots of ways. It was, it was a great benefaction to any place. You get a, you get a huge imperial construction, you get um, an, uh, a great big park, and you get space for all kinds of statues and uh, offices, just like in, uh, just like in the foreign pockets. So it's a, it's, it's a very attractive and, and malleable plan. It was uh, a plan, at, or actually more properly, a building that was admired and commented on um, by, by authors shortly after it was built. So for example, um, here, Hadrian built in Athens a shrine for Olympian Zeus, but his most famous is the hundred columns of Phrygian marble with walls built just like the columns and pavilions with gilded roofwork and alabaster decorated with statues and paintings. Books are also kept in them. That is a description showing you what was really impressive about this, not the books, but the gilding, the columns, the place where the columns come from, which is Turkey, the number of columns, 100 of them, the statues, all of that fancy stuff. That description, oh, I'm just going to skip this for a second. All right. That description comes from a book by a fellow named Pausanias, who lived shortly after the time of the Emperor Hadrian, about 150 CE, the middle of the second century, he comes from the province of Asia, the Roman province of Asia, which we now know today as Turkey. And just like the Emperor Hadrian, Pausanias loved Greece, all things Greek, and was very impressed with antiquity. He was very impressed with the past. And he wrote this book, A Guide to Greece, which you can buy today by ordering on Amazon.com and get a nice cheap used copy. Uh, it was put out by Penguin, although there, I think there are lots of editions of Pausanias' Guide to Greece. In an era of peace and prosperity, which the middle of the second century CE was, the citizenry of the Empire of Rome, who inhabited all these colored spots on the map around the Mediterranean, in addition to feeling quite content with and proud of current world that they lived in, the political regime that they lived under, were most impressed with 
the past. The past held a great allure for uh, people in this time, including Pausanias. He, um, he traveled all over Greece. He went looking at these old, old monuments. He was most impressed with statues, paintings, and the stories, the old stories. So when he goes, for example, up to the Acropolis, he says, there's a building called the Parthenon. And then he describes the scenes on the pediments and the metopes. He doesn't say anything about, you know, this is a beautiful building, it's so large, it's so perfect, it's so, no, none of that. It's all, it, it, it's, it's all about all of these old stories. And towards the end of his book, after wandering all over Greece and seeing the remnants of mighty, mighty past cities and, and old events and times, Pausanias gets philosophical. And he says, I know that fortune alters everything, strong and weak, things at their beginning and things at their end, and drives everything with a strong necessity according to her whim. Mycenae, which led the Greeks in the Trojan War, and Nineveh, the seat of the Assyrian kingdom, are deserted and demolished. Centers of overwhelming wealth in antiquity are not so prosperous now in the power of riches as a single moderately wealthy individual. The sanctuary of Bel survives at Babylon, but of that Babylon, which was the greatest city the sun saw in its time, nothing was left except a fortress wall, like the one at Tiryns in the Argolid. That is how temporary and completely insecure human things are. That is how temporary and completely insecure human things are. When times are good, it seems like they'll always be good. But time is not like that. After Hadrian was the Emperor Antoninus Pius, he ruled from 138 to 161. It was in his lifetime that Pausanias lived and traveled and wrote his many chaptered travelogue of his trip to Greece. A younger relative of Antoninus Pius, raised from youth, knowing that he would be emperor upon the death of Antoninus Pius, was Marcus Aurelius. Here is a statue of him well before he became emperor, a life-size marble portrait statue indicating already that great things were expected of him. In his youth, he studied philosophy. He studied Greek and the Stoic philosophers. He was a contemplative man, but a peaceful contemplative life was not to be his. Instead, early on, all of the Germanic tribes north of the Danube, who had many, many relatives and ancestral homelands south of the Danube that had long since been put under Roman rule, these many tribes connected and rose up in concerted rebellion, and Marcus Aurelius was compelled to spend almost the entirety of his rule on the German frontier. For those of you that have watched the movie Gladiator, this is where it opens, on the German frontier in the reign of Marcus Aurelius. Traveling with Marcus Aurelius, just as travel, had traveled with Trajan, were chronographers, historians, and, and artists. And at the war's conclusion, a memorial, a monument, was built 
in Rome. It was built up here in the northern part of the Campus Martius, just south of the Arapacus and the great horologium, the sundial with the obelisk from Egypt. So removed from the imperial fora down in this area in the center of the city um, in a compound that included a temple to the deified Marcus. And the column was, was set on axis with the temple in an arrangement evocative of the arrangement of the Column of Trajan. Although, of course, the Column of Trajan is on the back side of the Basilica Ulpia and so um, not visible from the Forum. And here it is, standing below it and looking straight up, the Column of Marcus Aurelius, which, like the Column of Trajan, on which it is clearly almost precisely modeled, is 100 feet high, just like the Column of Trajan, with 17 individual drums of marble, just like the Column of Trajan, and with a 710-foot spiral relief all the way to the top, just like the Column of Trajan. Differences, small in terms of um, of that aspect of design. The Column of Trajan had 24 spirals. The Column of Marcus really is 22 and a half, so that each spiral is a little bit higher, which eases the visibility factor. Not that you wouldn't go cross-eyed and half-blind trying to pick out all the figures on it standing from below, which you would. Um, the figures are in higher relief. There's less background, uh, less landscape. Much of the setup and the scenes are the same, perhaps because the Column of Trajan was a specific model, but more likely because there is a sameness to many aspects of war. Armies are always on the march. Camps always must be built. Battles always must be fought. So just as with the column of Trajan, the army has to set out. And just as there, they cross the Danube on a pontoon bridge. Here are the roiling waters of the river. Here are the boats lashed together. Here's the platform. And then uh, horses and soldiers uh, march along on their way to uh, meet the Germanic tribes. You see them emerging out of an arcaded entrance, a gate from a Roman city into enemy territory. You might have felt, you might have felt, staring at these beady little figures on the Column of Trajan, that it was kind of hard to pick out the details. It seems that the sculptors, the designers of the Column of Marcus Aurelius feel your pain because they modified the style of portraying these images so that it would be easier for you to see. So rather than the kind of busy amalgam of overlapping figures in many receding planes that you can see on most of the scenes, individual scenes on the Column of Trajan. Here, there tend to be one, two, two sort of deliberate rows. And within any row, there's frequently, it's frequently only one person deep. Sometimes there are a couple of people. But it does, it does make it easier for you to feel that you've seen the detail that you need to see. Further, there is a lot of repetition of pose so that you can look at an image and get the idea of what the scene is supposed to be without having to really deconstruct the details. So here, uh, all of these guys, sort of like columns, are standing alertly before um, actually, the emperor, the emperor is up here, sadly, have, has partially lost his head. Um, standing, uh, and so y y you can't, you don't necessarily need to pick out individual figures to know that these are people standing in front of a, of a dais or an elevated platform listening to somebody talk. 
So specific people and specific events in this way turn into symbols, symbols of those events, like a stamp instead of a careful individual depiction. Like the Column of Trajan, Marcus Aurelius appears 60 times. And like the Column of Trajan, Marcus Aurelius is fully engaged with the events that his troops are engaged in. He is receiving a delegation here. He is making a sacrifice here. Here's the little altar. We see him addressing the troops. We see him receiving um, the tokens of battle. We see him in all the many guises that a commander in chief must be in. Like the column of Trajan, on the column of Marcus Aurelius, the Romans engage in some of their standard battle tactics, such as the Testudo formation, which you may recall seeing last week. And you may recall that that is uh, people overlapping their long shields and then advancing as one, like a, like a gigantic human armadillo, <laughs> um, towards, towards the enemy. And you see the, the Germanic en enemy, um, their heads peeking up over, over the top here. And so in the welter of detail on the column, the sculptors have worked to make sure that you will, insofar as possible, be able to get the point of individual scenes. Um, so you see people lined up and their helmets like like all of the bows in the, viol in the string section of an orchestra, all at the same angle. And in spot after spot um, on, on the column, you get that. And that's why when some of the scenes turn ugly, you have to know that you were expected to be able to see that. Sometimes the ugliness is the inescapable ugliness of pitched battle. In one amazing battle that took place um, on, a, on a, a day when the Romans knew that they were outnumbered by the Germanic forces that were arrayed against them. Uh, as they approached the site of a battle for which both sides were arrayed um, on, on either side of a huge plain, uh, an enormous storm broke out. A rainstorm broke out. And the storm enveloped, the uh, crashed down and flooded the side of the field that the Germans were on and, and was so catastrophic that the German forces were swept away in a kind of flood. And that's the scene right here. And this is actually a depiction of the rain, although he's anthropomorphized and he, he has a head. But he has these big rain cloud arms, and you see the horizontal bodies of the Germans being swept away, and, and the Romans all sort of stopped upright um, bef beforehand. So, so a kind of miraculous salvation by, by nature. Well, that's a battle between um, between two sides that are armed. But the Roman fighting on the German frontier was not confined to fighting men at arms. The Romans brutally 
annihilated villages, captured women and children. Here, two Roman soldiers on either side of a woman crying, a young child reaching up to her in fright, looking for comfort. And you can tell from the bearing of the soldier that uh, there's no chance of mercy. <coughs> Setting fire to villages, these are huts, thatch. This is not an army camp. This is a place where civilians live. Here is a frightened woman and a child watching in horror and the torch being put. Captured prisoners killed on the spot. These men being surrounded and pierced with the lances, you will see that they have no arms. They are not soldiers. Or they are not fitted out here as soldiers. The reactions of the enemy are portrayed vividly on the column of Marcus Aurelius. These are not faceless, anonymous members of a crowd. They are individuals. This one, in the act of being killed, Some of the German tribes fought on the side of the Romans, German auxiliaries. Of course, some of them lived within long-standing Roman provinces, Upper and Lower Pannonia, part of what's today West Germany. And frequently, the Roman <coughs> legions had Germans do the dirtiest of the killing of other Germans. Here, German auxiliaries decapitating bound German prisoners. Some of the results of their work laying here on the ground. Here's the head. Here's the head. Here's the body. The expression still on the face. Here's a detail of this head, a man about to be killed. Now somebody had to take notes. Somebody had to make sketches. Somebody had to sculpt this picture. Somebody had to want to send a message, a message not really all that different from the one in the Iliad 800 years earlier. A man dies still if he has done nothing as one who has done much. Are the sons of Atreus alone among mortal men, the ones who love their wives? We are on opposite sides, but we are all human. Maybe the sculptors of the column of Marcus Aurelius came to feel the need 
to portray these horrible deeds in enduring stone to cleanse their own souls. But maybe they were inspired by or even instructed by the man who led the troops in battle. Marcus Aurelius, every evening in his tent, day after day, month after month, on the German frontier, meditated about what exactly the Romans were doing there. And the book survives today. It's called The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. You can buy it on Amazon.com. This portrait head of Marcus Aurelius comes from a house, a rich house, or a house of a rich person, in the city of Ephesus. You remember Ephesus? We looked at a little temple there a long time ago with those cute little gold figurines. Ephesus grows up to be a big city. It becomes the capital of the Roman province of Asia. Pausanias certainly had visited Ephesus. It was a huge and glittering city, beautiful, with colonnaded streets and theaters and fora and many, many statues and a big library and, as many nice cities will have, a wealthy district. And in this wealthy district were beautiful houses with wall paintings on the walls and columns in their courtyards. And in one of those houses was a rich guy who loved his country, his country being Rome, the Roman Empire. And how do we know? Because he had a room with portrait heads of Roman emperors. Not every single one of them. Not the bad ones. Not like, you know, Caligula and Nero. Not them. But the good emperors. Augustus, Claudius, Vespasian, Titus, Trajan, and Marcus Aurelius. A sort of gallery. Ephesus has been excavated for over 100 years by the Austrian Archaeological Institute. And there's a nice museum at the site, if you go to the site. And in one of the rooms of the museum are all the portrait heads from this one rich house, including this portrait head of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. And one of the times when I was visiting Ephesus, and I was sitting in this room in the museum, one of the washer ladies came in to clean Marcus Aurelius. You know, the heads get dusty. And when I think about Marcus Aurelius and what he thought 2,000 years ago on the Danube frontier in his tent at night, I think we think about Roman emperors like this, but he knew that one day it was going to be like this. Marcus Aurelius wrote, letting go all else cling to the following few truths. Remember that man lives only in the present, in this fleeting instant. All the rest of his life is either past and gone or not yet revealed. This mortal life is a little thing lived in a little corner of the earth. Marcus Aurelius wrote, a spider is proud of catching a fly, so is one man of trapping a hare, or another of netting a sprat, or a third of capturing boars, or bears, or sarmatians, which are one of the Germanic tribes. If you go into the question of principle, are these anything but robbers, one and all? And Marcus Aurelius, who allowed and, I believe, encouraged 
his sculptors to bring back to Rome the message that life is not only lived in the present, that the details matter, and that victory comes at a cost, not just to your enemy, but to you. Wrote. Look down from above on the numberless herds of mankind with their mysterious ceremonies, their diverse voyagings in storm and calm, and all the checkered pattern of their coming and gatherings and goings. Go on to consider the life of bygone generations. That's what Pausanias did. And then the life of all those who are yet to come. That would be us. And even at the present day, the life of the hordes of far-off savages, that would be the German tribes. In short, reflect what multitudes there are who are ignorant of your very name. How many more will have speedily forgotten it? How many perhaps praising you now who will soon enough be abusing you? And that therefore, remembrance, glory, and all else together are things of no worth. In every time in a culture, it seems we focus more on the present or the future or the past. From Titus to Trajan, it was the present. Rome in its present day glory. And in the time of Hadrian and Antoninus Pius, in the two generations of the early second century CE, it was the past. The gloriousness of it, the longevity of it, the mysteriousness of it, the allure. And Marcus Aurelius says, think to the future. It turns out we're just one of many. And as much importance as you think you have, one day it will be like this. This morning on the news, I heard that President Obama will soon be announcing his plan for Afghanistan. 38,000 more troops, he says, added to the 68,000 that will be there. That's the word. What sort of monument one day will sum up that war? There is some material for you to think about over Thanksgiving.